grants uh, by now, but we were uh, trying to be respectful of the mayor and giving her an opportunity to launch her budget, which is happening as we speak, uh, before determining uh, what uh, grant programs for next year would look like. Uh, for those of you who I did not share this with previously, we've already paneled uh, the general operating support grants. Um, uh, we did that uh, earlier in April. We had 132 applications and had six panels uh, that all went pretty seamlessly. So at least that piece is in the bag, as it were. And so our hope will be that we'll announce those awards uh, at the beginning of October. Uh, I know in the past we have uh, issued letters of intent in, in advance of October to give folks a sense of, um, you know, what type of funding they would have from the commission. We're holding that at the moment just because we want to have a better sense of what our budget will be for next year before making promises we cannot keep. Um, so, but as soon as we know that, and as soon as we know how much money we can put in general operating support, we will let you all know. Uh, but our intention is to push uh, that general operating support at the door at the beginning of October. Um, you know, we are trying to be respectful and responsive to the immediate need that people are having um, in dealing with uh, everything that's going on. But we all also, and I, I think I may have said this before, we are trying to give a sense of forward momentum and movement. Um, so while our goal is still to have project-based grants uh, next year, I would encourage you uh, to do two things in particular. One is to uh, take the opportunity to see what your technology needs might be um, should this pandemic continue and should some of your programming move to virtual platforms on a longer term basis, um, but also to really try to work closely with um, either individual charter schools uh, and with DC public schools to really make sure that you are meeting the needs of the schools. Um, I had a conversation with Mary last week and I don't know if she has joined us yet, but um, what we're hoping to do at some point when the grant window is open is for her to convene a meeting uh, where she can share out what, uh, you know, how DCPS in particular is moving forward for next year and what would really be helpful for um, for her and uh, DCPS teachers um, as uh, applicants to our various programs, particularly the arts education program. Um, how, you know, as you craft your applications that you're really trying to do so in consonance with the needs of the school system. Um, uh, other than that, we're just trucking along. Uh, some of you may have applied to the, uh, the NEA CARES Act grant that opened and closed last week. It was a pretty intense week, but uh, we really wanted to, um, you know, uh, strip down the application, have a really quick turnaround. And so we plan on notifying uh, folks uh, of those awards. Uh, at the uh, uh, not the end of this week, uh, but the end uh, towards the end of next week. So, um, so that's really it just for now. Um, I hope that we'll be able to uh, make a more formal announcement about what grants will look like for next year, the project-based grants and the fellowship grants. I hope we can do that by the end of this week. And uh, we have a commission meeting this coming Thursday, and so um, you know, once the commission finds out, or finds out signs off on um, what it is we're proposing, then we'll announce it to, to everyone. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, okay, so. thanks, David. Thank you for sharing that. And um, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of shifting and uh, need to be fluid at this point uh, as we're figuring out and navigating the landscape and I don't know, if, oh, there is Mary. Mary is on the call, good. Um, so I think a good segue and piggyback, unless uh, we'll we can take some questions if anyone has for David, I uh, just wanted to uh, share, we have some DC collaborative updates we were gonna hold until the end of the conversation, but I think very relevant to what David had just shared. Um, we've been working very closely with DCPS and with some charters since May thir uh, March 13th. Um, in making our pivots. And one of the things, you know, lo even looking at 
talking to LEAs in the DMV, which is something we're going to look at too, um, and how we are resourcing the arts and, and humanities education learning opportunities. The DC Collaborative, as you may have seen from our email last week, uh, is once again in uh, response mode, and we are uh, rebranding Office, our Arts and Humanities for Every Student program, that legacy program we've done now uh, since our inception uh, 20, now almost three years ago. Uh, we are focusing on experiential learning. And in fact, we've been beta testing platforms uh, so that we hope that this, opp this opportunity for experiential learning in whatever form it may take uh, can be executed in as seamless fashion as possible. Uh, we're looking at still continuing a lottery program, looking at equitable access to learning opportunities. Uh, what does it look like to have an air, in air quotes, live performance, a virtual streaming event? That's actually what we're beta testing this Friday with Washington Bach Consort. Um, but know that we are looking to service all of these grants, uh, continuing to work with the DAHI grantees that we were already working with. We've been having those conversations uh, as quickly as we can as we're reinventing the Arts and Humanities for Every Student program. So we will be ready by the new school year. Uh, we have been looking at curricular connections for a very long time, as you all know, and now we really are. And we were really excited to hear that Mary and David had had those uh, same conversations. And Mary, maybe if you could share a little bit more specifically about some of those curricular connections and how uh, this could look for us in the future. I think this is more than just a one-time conversation that's needed, uh, but we will be continuing to do that work. Uh, as many of you know, we quickly created a distance learning resource database that was not to be the only option for learning, but it was a very necessary and important pivot uh, and David, as, as we know, uh, measuring impact is very important for all of us as a community overall. Uh, during these challenged times, we could not come up with that vehicle to measure impact immediately, but we will be looking at that moving forward. Uh, but we want to hear from folks that are looking at out of school time as well. And I know there are a few of us on the call today. Uh, there are concerns about what the budget may look like next year. Um, I know Katrina, you're on, Maureen, I see you, our friends at Project Creator on too. Uh, what's going to happen to out of school time funding for in the next year's budget? How do we as a community really band together? And I think making sure there's curricular connection so there's ongoing student learning is going to be most critical. So I'll get off my little soapbox for now because I promised we would talk about this at the end of the meeting. But I was, I was really excited when David shared uh, the conversations he's been having with Mary because those uh, piggyback exactly what we've been working on with Mary as well and what we've been what our next phase of arts and humanities for every student looks like because now it is experiential learning in the classroom out of the classroom whatever the landscape may be during school hours out of school hours it becomes all of it great no that's really important thank you Lisa now more than ever we have to work you know closer together and be aware Absolutely. of the needs um, you know of each of our populations are so uh, Absolutely. Does anyone have any questions for David? I don't I have, see. I, oh, sorry. Did somebody have a question? I don't see anything in the chat. Nope. Can I ask a question? Uh, hey, Hi. I always have a question. Sorry, David. <laughs> um, I'm wondering. First of all, thank you for the the release of um, matches for this fiscal year. I think that was a field ask and, and really, really well received uh, by us all. And wondering if there's going to be any consideration of similar changes for FY21 grants. Um, and if there's going to be any more of a concentration on general operating, I know you're saying you're still doing projects, but can we hope that any more of the money might be shifted to general operating, which we're all going to need to to endure? Yep. Yeah. So I'm not really at liberty to give specifics, but uh, I will share with you that our goal is to preserve 
general operating support and the fellowship grant. And for those of you who are not familiar with the fellowship grant, that's a grant that's for individual artists. We like to call it the general operating support for individuals. And um, there's you know much more latitude as to how those monies can be used. So they are our priorities. Um, uh, we have, you know, we are looking at paring down a lot of the project-based grants. Um, but as I said, we should have more details, including, you know, a conversation around match requirements. We should be able to share that by the end of the week. Uh, and then if any of you, you know, the commission meeting that, uh, the commission meetings that take place, they're always open to the public to listen in. So if, um, uh, you know, if you'd like to, that's this coming Thursday. Um, we did push, uh, the week before last, um, uh, we put together two surveys, one for individuals and one for organizations and pushed them out the door. And we had really, re thank you so much for everybody who responded to them because, you know, we have a certain perspective here at the commission. Our commissioners have a certain perspective from, you know, how they engage with you know, the community of organizations and artists. But we said it's really important to hear from the folks such as yourselves. And so a lot of people responded to those surveys and we have folded, you know, uh, those responses into, um, you know, the proposed slate that we're putting forward. Um, but as I said, by the end of the week, you'll have more, a clearer sense of, of, you know, how we are moving forward. We will have a clearer sense of how we're mo moving forward once we get our, our mark for the budget. Um, uh, um, but we are aware that, you know, those general operating dollars are the most critical dollars, um, but also because artists are doers that we want to make sure that there's opportunity for them to do and again to have this sense of forward momentum um, as well as being able to keep their doors open and their lights on. Uh, yeah. So on. Um, Thanks. Yeah, David, there's a question from Christy. Two questions have come in first. Can, uh, just a clarifying question. Sure. When, uh, when should you be able to announce more about next fiscal year grants? Are you, are you saying we won't hear about the GOS grants until October or is it before then? Just for clarification. So in the past with GOS, what we've done is we usually panel them. The application and the paneling process take place earlier in the year. And so what we've done in the past is at the end of April, we have issued what we call intent to fund letters. So, you know, God willing and the creek don't rise, come October 1st, we will uh, award your organization X number of dollars. And the reason we've done that is to allow organizations to better plan for their following year, particularly those organizations that may rely pretty heavily on the GOS dollars we give them. Mm -hmm. It may help them actually craft their budget for next year. Um, but also um, those intent to fund letters usually go out just before we launch the project-based grants. And in the past, we've had some folks who will um, uh, who will say, you know, something my the intent to fund amount was low enough that um, uh, you know we will we're going to tr try our chances with project-based grants instead. Uh, the um, uh, uh, and so that's why we've done it. Just with not knowing what the budget is going to be for next year, um, what we. Uh, we didn't want to set up false expectations. So we didn't want to, you know, tell somebody that they were going to get $100,000 from us come October and then our budget is eviscerated and, you know, we have to go back to them and say, oh, that award is only going to be $50,000. Um, so we're just holding off until we have a more accurate sense of what the budget is and how the budget splits into, you know, the various <laughs> buckets of funding that we have. Um, but as I said, hopefully we will know more this week once, you know, we have the budget from the mayor um and uh once the commissioners meet on thursday uh um, and if we can issue those intent to fund letters you know in a month's time or two months time uh, we will do that so mm -hmm. thanks thanks for explaining that david um question from ashley about the field trip grants mm -hmm. uh if they can if the field trip grants may be used for technology to reach the students virtually so uh, I guess I have a qualifying question back. <laughs> Is it for this current year or for next year? Uh, Ashley, do you want to jump on? Oops. She may, it doesn't say in her message. 
Oh, here she is for the current year and pushing into next year. Um, yeah, so for the current year, I thought I had spoken with uh, everybody who's involved in the field trip grant itself, the initiative that everybody who wanted to make an adjustment to the scope of what it was they were doing, the timeline for delivery, and then also reworking numbers like uh, line items in their budgets. Um, uh, you know, I thought I had reached everybody, but I may not have. So Ashley, reach out to me if uh, we didn't have the opportunity to speak. Um, but yes, um, you know, because a lot of money goes into the cost of bus transportation um, and nobody's being bused anywhere at the moment. You know, if you have to, you know, change those dollars to, um, you know, technology and or technical support personnel, um, then, you know, that is fine. I've had conversations with organizations about uh, filming uh, productions, but then, you know, there are some costs associated with that, particularly if it's an equity house and, um, and so there are limitations, parameters and limitations on what can be done, uh, you know, in that area. So um, it's not a one size fits all. And that's why we sent that project adjustment form out so folks could respond to it. And even then, some folks were saying, oh, we'll, you know, we'll just move it to the fall. And that's our plan B. But, you know, they may also have to have a plan C in their back pocket just in case plan B. Um, you know, materialize. Yeah. I just want to throw it out there too. It seems, I know some of you invo are involved in um, summer youth employment. Uh, it looks as if it may be moving forward this year. Um, again, I think they're thinking of a, it being a virtual experience. Um, you know, the challenge we have, we don't take on young people uh, here ourselves at the commission but we usually take on about 80 or 90 young people and then distribute them to, you know, eight or 10 arts organizations. Um, uh, myself and a colleague were putting together a short survey to push out to folks um, who have either participated with us directly in the past or who I know have summer youth employment programs, um, but may not have worked through us, may have worked directly with summer youth employment. Um, and so we're planning on pushing a survey out just to see who is and if they are planning on engaging in that program this year and if they're planning on doing so virtually, uh, you know, we would love to get, um, you know, your response on that because we may be very well able to um, uh, channel some dollars your way to help facilitate that. Um, so, so if I don't, I know Maureen, you've worked with us in the past at Sitar. See Edda on the line too from Ovius, and you guys were with us last year. And um, so, please, if there's anyone who's on the line who is uh, planning on having a virtual summer program this year, and might uh, you know think of a way of being able to involve young people virtually as classroom assistants or um, so on, please let me know because we're really thinking about it. I always think of summer youth employment as sort of a, a paid internship program that it's. You know, it's a learning process for these young people. So there may be ways that we can engage them through some training for themselves, uh, um, uh, as well as engaging them uh, in the classroom. So, um, so I will reach out to folks. But if there's anyone on the call who, you know, uh, thinks I may not know that they have a summer youth employment program, please let me know, and I'll make sure to include them. Thanks, David. Um, I think just one more clarifying question around field trip grants yep. uh, uh, from Roberta. And that is if DCPS indicates a need in a specific area, will the boundaries in the field trip grants be relaxed as to what grades can participate and in which discipline? And again, again I guess my question is for this year or for next year or? Uh... Next year. Um, I would rather have that conversation with, you know, with Mary as a preface or DCPS and the charter schools as a preface to just saying yes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the reason that there are restrictions, um, as it were, 
um, on the program is not because I dislike any particular grade or any particular discipline. Um, uh, you know, what I've seen in the school systems is that um, the closer we can tie these experiences to the content of the classroom in a particular grade, uh, the one, the easier the sell is uh, to the school, uh, because hopefully the teachers of that particular grade see the direct connection and the direct value to participation and hopefully it enables them to make a, a compelling reason to their school administrator to allow them to participate um, but also in terms of and we've talked about this before in terms of assessment um, it's you know if you have you know young people who are in kindergarten and eighth grade and twelfth grade all participating in the same opportunity just that the engagement looks very different and so i think if we have um uh it, it's easier for us and i think it's more compelling data to um to focus on particular grades mm -hmm. now, i've shared this with folks before my goal would be that there would be an arts experience uh for every student at every grade uh, throughout their um, you know, their, their grade school uh, career. Um, and, you know, and I know there's a lot of uncertainty with this coming year as to when school will go back, as to whether young people will be allowed off campus uh, when they've just gotten back on campus. Um, so, you know, we may see a bit of a hiatus um, this coming year on field trips. But I don't think we should just sit and say, OK, let's wait for next year. Let's you know, really think about what we can do this coming year if there is a hiatus to really plan in an intentional and strategic way um, for the years to come. So yeah. this will not last forever. Yes, I, think I just stole one of the saccharine lines from television that we're being bombarded with. But it will not last forever. Somebody <laughs> will solve the problem. So. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Well, I think what we do have to do is really true collective impact work and really hone in and focus in on the needs of our public educators and speak to, and this is a great segue into our update with Mary, speak to DCPS arts team, speak to the core group of arts and humanities educators in the charter schools as well to make sure that what we can do as we make these shifts, as we work on experiential learning in di on different platforms and in different flexible ways, that there are direct curricular connections in everything we do. We aspire to do that during normal good times, but now we need to look at this fully. We need to look at it both during in-school time as well as out of school all of the learning, also how families get engaged with arts and humanities education opportunities. That's very important. Um, and that's a really great segue into some of the exciting updates that we actually do have to share uh, working with DCPS. Uh, I just froze. Mm. Sugar, I don't know if you all can hear me, but I we just can, uh, yes. Okay. Sorry, guys. Oh, good. Okay. So uh, to that, a uh, great. So I have to repeat myself. Um, so to that end, I'd like to introduce Mary for an update, and then uh, we'll we'll take questions, and we'll also be able to share out a few more exciting things that the collaborative is working on collaboratively uh, with DCPS. Good morning, everyone. Good to see all your faces. Uh, it's funny how this new new world we're in where our uh, ability to connect with others is always through the computer, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I relate to so much that David said and Lissa said about how our roles are constantly pivoting and changing. Uh, my role has changed a bit recently in that uh, I now, areas that I maybe slightly stepped into other people's work, I'm having to, like especially within DCPS and then within the community, uh, I'm having to sort of fully put myself into those positions instead of just a little uh, dipping a toe into that. Um, you know, thinking of things like the family engagement office at DCPS, uh, helping to bring together the community in a variety of ways. Um, so, you know, we're pivoting on so many levels. It's, it's, it's exciting and also a, a, quite the time keeper <laughs> for all of us. Um, uh, so, you know, I think that something that is important that 
I have really talked about with my team and then talking with Lissa and David is we're entering a new version of education. Uh, no matter, you know, even if in August we could be back in school 100%, education is going to be different. Um, if even just looking at the fact that our teachers are finally able to really all be on board with technology, which is something that, you know, we all sort of dragged our feet on whether we wanted to be with it or not be with it, but all the teachers have been forced into to being a part of that and are adopting it a lot more and, and finding the bonuses of that. Um, and then, you know, just thinking about your role and your work of the field trips and the supports that of how we can interact between the classroom and our partners is, is becoming much more tech savvy and, and heavy. Um, and so, you know, definitely for those of you who have pivoted as, as quickly as say Lissa and David and everybody else has, I want to say a huge thank you to you because I, fully understand how much work that is and uh, those of you that have been able to pivot and and support us and what we're doing it's made our work possible it's not something that we could have done without you um, you know when we're looking at this new format of education we also have to take a step back and think what do we want our kids to get out of this so you know DCPS is all about backwards design and education so it's not just something getting the kids on the platform and getting them to engage, but what is actually meaningful education to them? So as we move into this uh, hybrid learning style that will probably happen uh, in the fall, we're looking at, is it more about the thematic, the message of the arts? Is it about the technique? Is it sort of a combination of, our, what do we want our kids to get out of it to ensure that they are moving forward in their education, specifically their arts education? And I think that the benefit of the, what we've been doing already in DCPS with the framework of arts and learning, it is already very thematic and project-based. Uh, so we are set up for success in a lot of ways with that, which is really wonderful. And then the technique side of everything is just one of the tools that gets you to that final thematic idea. And that seems to be what all of the other districts are, are struggling to figure out how to do now. So we are a step ahead, which is really wonderful. When I'm on calls with directors from around the country, they a lot of them are still very technique-based and trying to figure out how am I going to convince my teachers that theme-based is the way to go? Because not only are we teaching them all new techniques, but we're also trying to convince them of a new format of teaching. And um, so it is, it is a new world that we're walking into. Um, and I also recognize too that there are a lot of concerns from the community, from internal and external community around what is all of this technology gonna do to my business in the long run kind of mentality. So on the teaching artist side, am I creating a series of videos that'll make it so that I'm no longer needed? to come into the classroom? Am I creating virtual field trips that then will make it so that the students will no longer come to my performances or my field trips? Um, and I think that that's one of those things where it is a call to action to us of how are we moving ourselves forward in that, um, you know, looking at the teaching artists and if, if we're doing a small technique by video, how are we utilizing that to ensure that that video is, almost an advertisement to the fact that you need me in your classroom when we are back there full time. Uh, how are we using the virtual field trips to make it just more comfortable for people to come to our events and our, our museums? Um, so hopefully, you know, I use the, the idea in another call of if we have only 10 elementary schools going to the Smithsonian right now and we can get maybe an additional 20 or 30 to watch a live session, then of that 20 or 30, how many more would be more comfortable to go to the museum when it reopens? And that is the math that I think that we need to focus on and, and push our work forward because I think that this is a, a time that could really launch some beautiful uh, partnerships within our community. Um, and so that's how we're working as well. And um, within that, so what's coming up, we don't have any definite answers yet. As you know, the mayor is scheduled to make her announcement on Friday. Uh, DCPS will put out several announcements on Friday following the mayor's talk as well. Um, but I can tell you that moving forward, we are looking at a hybrid format of learning. So um, kids will probably go to school maybe one day a week, 
maybe two days a week. Maybe they'll go to school for a week and then have two weeks off. It'll be very small classrooms, uh, you know, looking at pre-K through K, probably only six kids in a classroom, grades one through 12, maybe 10 kids in a classroom. And that will rotate to get all of the kids in. Um, and then the rest of the time would be distance learning, so virtual. Uh, there's a lot of factors in there that they're trying to figure out. How does that look at the teacher's schedule? How are we working that into the fact that there might not be childcare and teachers have children as well? And you know, they have to watch kids and host and you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's so many factors that they're trying to work through. Um, so that's, that's a large thing that will come out. It at least began becoming a community conversation on Friday. Um, we are going to have several versions of summer school, something that I am working with um, summer school and the family engagement office at DCPS is Parent University. Uh, I'm sure several of you have heard of it. It was primarily put out there just for the parents of the little guys, the pre-Kers of looking at um, you know, conscious discipline style of, of parenting, that sort of thing, but they have expanded it. It's all grade levels now, um, and it's basically for the summer going to be, how can we have a family and student engagement time? Um, so our first one is going to be next week that we're working in collaboration with them on. Uh, and uh, thankfully the Pulitzer Center has agreed to be one of our first guests and was able to, to do that quick pivot. <laughs> we just introduced them last week and now they're gonna quickly pivot and make something for next week for us. Um, but it's gonna be, a uh, tailgate on the everyday DC project that we do, where students are photographing their community. And um, so they're going to have the parents think of it in the mindset of, OK, your kid's on their phone all the time. Now let's engage the parent and the kid on the phone at the same time. Um, and so how are we taking pictures of our community with our phone? And then what are we doing with that on social media? And um, uh, looking at the larger message of, of what COVID-19 has done to our community. So that'll be the first of. Um, there's expected to be some format of teacher PD at the end of the year. So classes end May 29th. Um, the stay at home orders until June 8th. So we can't expect parents or teachers to go into the schools until after that. Um, but there is definitely still the cleanup and close out of classrooms that has to happen. And then um, professional development to get teachers ready for fall. Um, a large part, the two largest buckets in that will probably be uh, professional development on technology and then trauma informed teaching. Uh, and what does that look like moving forward in an uh, hybrid learning. Um, you know, as, if, uh, as any of you can imagine, and especially those of you at museums that only have little moment buckets with kids, uh, if you're only seeing them once a week, how are you creating that classroom culture that is so important to learning? And um, so that will be a large focus for all of that as well. Um, so there's that PD then the summer school on a variety of levels. Summer school will mostly be focused on students looking at um, the core course uh, catch up. So any students who maybe weren't able to engage this past semester or need it for graduation, any of that sort of thing. And then they're, uh, for the first time, they're doing a summer school for all levels. So pre-K through 12, which is really nice as well to help out families. Um, there is also, uh, many of you have probably heard about the rumors or the, the talk of doing um, a K through 12 cornerstone in the fall. Mm -hmm. And that'll be um, uh, sort of an archive of our experience right now. Um, so the logistics of that are still being worked on, but that will definitely be a partner heavy uh, project. And it's uh, being done for a few reasons. Um, one, it'll be a great way to set community engagement and that authentic learning for the first month of school, give kids a chance to work through the issues, so that whole trauma informed social emotional learning, um, give schools uh, sort of an even playing field of getting that classroom culture set up, uh, where everybody's working towards this one larger, greater good. Um, and then also it'll just be a really beautiful, rich way of uh, marking what we've gone through over the last few months and, and where we're going with it too, because it's not over, right? And in, in August, it won't be over. Um, uh, so helping to make that, that um, uh, feeling of accomplishment in, in what we're all experiencing together as well as building the community around it too. Um, um, and I think that's it. That's it. <laughs> 
Ah, oh, that's a lot. It is. <laughs> Thank you for sharing all of that, Mary. Um, does anyone have any questions for Mary as you take all of that in? Okay, a couple things have popped up. Katrina asks, are there any updates on timing for summer school or when summer school will begin? Uh, so they haven't officially launched a date, but if you consider that um, the teacher contract runs through the 22nd of June, that would be the earliest that they'd be able to start it. Um, so PD could feasibly run through June 19th, which is a Friday. And then that following Monday, the 22nd, would be the first chance that they could launch it. So based on just timing of thinking of trying to get it all finished by the end of July, I would imagine it's either going to be that week of the 22nd or the following week of the 29th. They typically want to have six weeks. So uh, we don't know first day of school for the fall yet, but if they decide to do a rolling start, it probably will be earlier than the normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then that also uh, impacts a lot of our work in helping to align, line up uh, supplementary learning opportunities mm -hmm. if that start date, um, we flip the switch a different time. A uh, question from Lacey, if our organization is offering summer arts programming, should we email you to get the word out to students' families? Um, definitely. Well, so if you're going to do uh, summer programming, I would like to have a list, and I think that, Lissa, you can probably talk to this better, of what mm -hmm. we're doing in conjunction with the parent university. Sure. Part of the idea is, is that we are going to be publicly sharing in these public university forums what all of the partners are doing for the summer. Uh, yeah. So, you know, if there's not mass child care, parents are going to be desperate for <laughs> at home summer school wherever possible. So um, we are, we're hoping that this will be a really great chance for engagement. Yeah, indeed. And I'll share a bit more about Parent U in just a sec. Um, question from Christy. Do we have a sense of what time camp will happen each day for those of you, maybe folks who are have summer programming set up too? Uh, maybe if you want to chime in. So for DCPS, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that it's probably going to be at um, uh, in the afternoon. Um, we've heard a lot of feedback that, uh, especially when looking at the older kids, they just won't sign on in the morning. Um, so mm -hmm. doing it in the afternoon is definitely uh, smartest. I know that the parent university group said that they will only host things between 2 and 6 because any other time, it's either too late for the family or too early. Um, and then always making sure that we record it so that more people can reach it outside of that time period if needed. Yeah. That was helpful. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, and then also, Cynthia uh, had just mentioned and for our humanities friends that are on, uh, just just to, to remind everyone, when we speak about these curricular connections, which are going to be so important for us to look at, both within school, out of school learning opportunities, all of the work that we do, we need to make sure we're including ELA and social study connections, since many of us, many of our members have programming that may be a bit more aligned to ELA social studies than arts. And, and uh, this is something that the collaborative, is, as you all know, have historically held curricular connection convenings. We were really starting this past year to ramp up our work with ELA and social studies, um, and that will continue. So more to come there, for sure. Um, and related to that list, if you don't mind my interjecting, um, I think that a, another big bonus of what all is happening is that we are going to finally get a lot of the teachers and students on the same path when it comes to uh, what they're learning. Uh, and within that, so DCPS is uh, creating supports for all the teachers that will all live in one database. Um, so if they want uh, a classroom that's already set up and ready to go with like the videos that you all would help us create, virtual um, field trips, that sort of thing, um, any toolbox type items we would want, they will all be built into the curriculum. So it will get a lot more teachers on board to move forward with that. Um, but also then we are creating, and I was hoping to have it ready to show off today, but I'll um, maybe in the next meeting we'll walk through it all together, uh, creating a spreadsheet of all of our arts curriculum, so uh, music, performing arts, and visual arts, uh, looking at all of the arcs, the themes. So if you're wanting to create something about 
portraiture, our identity, you can easily grab from that theme. If you're wanting to create something about um, uh, improvisation for music, there'll be a quick, easy grab based on the technique side of everything. Uh, or if you're doing something just on keyboarding or just on uh, watercolor paints, it'll be an easy grab to find where that is within the curriculum. Uh, and then that way you can either link your field trip to that either the arc, the technique, whatever it may be, or if you already have a bank of videos that you would like to have supported in there, um, you know exactly what it would link to and it will be that easy grab. Um, I'm hoping that we can eventually make that happen across ELA and math and social studies mm -hmm. and science too. Yeah, and that's fantastic. And the collaborative will, um, we'll set up separate conversations uh, where Mary can walk all of us through this. Uh, and, and it's not just for the field trips, it's for all experiential learning, both in the class, you know, in school time, out of school time, anything that we're providing to students, uh, to students in the zero to 12 grade age range, whether it's during summer or after school, uh, we should be thinking to make sure there are there is alignment. And we'll also make sure to bring in uh, as Mary said, we'll get all of the other uh, connecting to curriculum, uh, that's our little jargony term right there, uh, stakeholders in these conversations. So we'll get we'll get the team from social studies and ELA uh, as part of that too. So uh, Mary touched on uh, some of the work that we're doing with DCPS in our broader collective impact work. Uh, our Any Given Child initiative uh, is now going to be going into our third year of implementation. And during this third year, it's a very interesting year, as, as we all know, um, we are really looking at reshifting, reconnecting, reaffirming alignment with DCPS to start. So that was something we were moving forward with great intentionality this past school year. Uh, we will continue to do that. There will be a very exciting announcement in mid-June uh, about some federal funding that the collaborative has once again secured uh, to move our collective impact work forward around data visualization, around data collection, uh, working very closely with all of you and DCPS and moving forward with that work. Uh, we're pretty excited about that, so stay tuned for that. Uh, Mary also talked a bit about parent university and part of our collective impact work is to make sure that we are reaching out to all stakeholders. And so through the Family Engagement Office, DC Collaborative has been introduced to Parent University, thanks to Mary. And as Mary mentioned, we're kicking off our first arts and humanities focused convening with Parent University uh, at the end of May with the Pulitzer Center and the Everyday DC program, which is this remarkable program. We're also excited to see how it will intersect with high school students and their families. Um, and this is really the launch and will become the launch of Arts and Humanities for Every, for Every Family initiative. It's something that the collaborative has wanted to work on for quite some time. And there will be more parent university, DC collaborative, Arts and Humanities for Every Family engagement opportunities moving forward. So this will be the first one that we kick off with this awesome program that DCPS uh, and Pulitzer Center partner on. So more to be announced around that soon. We're very excited as are the parent engagement, par uh, parents university team. Um, it's going to be increasingly more important for us to be looking at parents and caretakers in the work that we do as a community. Um, so again, thank you, Mary, for introducing that group to us. It's such a very important stakeholder group. Uh, and there'll be more ways for all of us to intersect uh, with that work. And then, of course, Arts and Humanities for Every Student continues, as I said. And you all probably should have seen the announcement that we put out uh, last week in our communications. And as I shared earlier in the conversation, we are reinventing Arts and Humanities for Every Student. It's version 2.0, V for virtual, really, V for victorious, which will be. And we're figuring that this is our, our new norm now. So we will work with you all to make sure that there are uh, secure platforms for student engagement that connect to what DCPS is using. As I said, we're beta testing 
we're beta testing Microsoft Teams right now with a project with Bot Consort. Uh, there will be more opportunities for us to look at and hone in on what our out of school time providers are also doing. Um, and I think there is a place for all of us in this work. So don't see arts and humanities for every student as just, oh, that's the field trip program. Uh, there's a lot more that we have to all do as a community together. And the most important thing we have to do now is advocate and use our voice because we're all waiting on budgets to come forward. We all know that there are going to be uh, great cuts to budgets and resources. We have to make sure that arts and humanities is seen as core and curricular in, in, in curriculum, in student learning. Uh, it is a core, uh, just as core as math and science as we know, but yet there is chance that we may see more cuts and we're hearing anecdotally things bubbling up in communities. Um, so I think it's very important for us to make sure that we have unified voice right now more than ever. So um, we'll start to work on framing more of those messages, especially through the summer. Um, but we're all anxious to see what the budget is looking like. Katrina, do you want to share some information about some concerns that we all share around out of school time funding? Yeah, sure. So, so we've been, um, many of us are a part of uh, DC Alliance of Youth Advocates, and so they've been doing a lot of work around preparation for this budget and what's going to happen, and then ensuring that um, there is funding for the out of school time um, for us to continue to be able to support students um, virtually and in this hybrid when we go back this fall. Um, so they are, they have a petition out. Um, and also a day of action will be June 3rd um, to advocate for advocate for the money for out of school time to stay. Um, the mayor's budget has some stabilizing money for grants um, there, but we need to make sure that we are protecting it um, and ensuring that it's it's kept as the uh, budget moves through city council. So um, that day of action will come right before the Committee on Education hearing. Um, so we ensure that the council members are really hearing from us and the impact that we're able to support schools in doing more and um, continuing to protect and support our children during this time. So let's see, Tracy, is it June 1st? I'm, we're gonna do a call, um, June. is that right? June 2nd, yeah. second. Um, We're gonna do a, a, a call here on the, with the collaborative um, to share more information about the budget and about that day of action. Um, so I think certainly around advocating for the arts funding and um, the OST funding are crucial um, during kind of this uncertain time. Thanks for sharing that, Katrina. And that we know impacts many of us on the call that have um, out of school time program. So uh, does, anyone have any questions uh, i know a lot of really important information was just shared and we made some big announcements too um, but any questions specifically from mary i'm trying to catch everything in the feed here no okay um Okay, not a question, but an announcement from Brian Shaw from In Series. There is a multilingual poetry contest, uh, and they've extended deadline for submissions to June first. You can see all of that info. So uh, the collaborative also typically, when we have information like this, we can get it out in our newsletters. Uh, we still have key communicator newsletters. Those are the newsletters that go out to the schools and principals as well. Uh, so just remember that those are tools in our wheelhouse that the collaborative always has for you monthly. So always stay in touch with us and we can get messaging out pretty quickly for everyone. Um, we will have follow-up conversations with Mary uh, around uh, making sure we're making these curricular connections when you're ready to launch. Maybe it's next week. We'll have announcements soon. Uh, that's, that's up to Mary. We'll be having more community conversations and convenings like this. Also, I want to give a shout out and a welcome if Valerie Graff is still on, uh, Valerie is the interim director of Humanities DC. She had joined us uh, today on this convening. Uh, also, as a reminder, for those of you that 
have humanities focused and based programming. Uh, you may be eligible for a National Endowment for Humanities Care Act grant, uh, similar to what the commission is able to provide through uh, the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, I know that that grant deadline is the end of the month. I want to say it's May 29th. I don't know if Valerie's still on to confirm. Um, don't see, but I see a few people nodding their heads. So just remember there's another CARES grant op the CARES Act grant opportunity for humanities-based organizations or programming. Uh, and if you need any more information about that, uh, just email me, Lisa, DC Collaborative. I can forward you that. Um, since I don't see Valerie up here right now. Okay, uh, any other questions or community announcements before we wrap it up? Uh, I just wanted to share real quick, um, I put our uh, virtual convening um, schedule in the chat. Um, we're confirmed for two weeks out. Um, uh, we're not doing chats every single day anymore. Um, if people would like to present or have something to share, it's open to anyone. So I'll go ahead and put the form if you would like to present on one of these in the future in the chat as well. Um, and uh, we also are still planning on having our membership meeting virtually. I think Ashley Harris and um, Addy from National Museum of Women in the Arts will be co-hosting us virtually. Um, they, I think the that meeting got canceled several times. <laughs> so we're kind of excited for the activities that they will have planned uh, around our members meeting. It'll be the week of June 16th. Um, so we'll just, we're just nailing down a date um, and confirming um, the, the speakers still. Um, so uh, please stay tuned for um, more virtual announcements. Thank you. Well, thanks everybody. And thank you, David. And thank you, Mary. These, these town hall convenings are so important. And who would have thought when we planned our first virtual town hall way, way back that um, we actually would need to have virtual town halls, right? So um, I appreciate, we appreciate you both so very much uh, and for sharing so much uh, as we all try to make sure that we're working together and collaboratively in, in support of students and their families and teachers uh, and make sure that we're all taking care of ourselves. It, these are uncharted and, and somewhat scary times for us as organizations as we're trying to figure out our budgets. And um, you know we all have been pivoting, uh, but I do remain optimistic that this is such a, because it is such a critical and crucial moment for education and in particular for arts and humanities that this is really a time for us to rally together and we have to figure out how to make our arts and humanities education advocacy efforts stronger than ever before. So um, my last announcement and shout out is if anyone is interested specifically in working on advocacy efforts uh, around arts and humanities education to reach out to me, just, at, just send me an email, lissa, L-I-S-S-A at DC Collaborative org um, because this is something we're going to need to move pretty swiftly on very soon. Uh, so again, thank you all. Sorry, am I? I'll uh, go for it, David. Yeah. Um, that the so we already had our performance oversight hearing, but the budget oversight hearing is coming up at the end that's of right. May. So that's an opportunity if anyone wants to testify. Um, yeah, can. absolutely. And the testimony will feel a bit different now. It's going to because we're doing this virtually um, and we'll have all of those dates coming up. Um, it's very important for us, for those of us that have testified in the past, we know how important these conversations and these testimonies are. And we need to support the commission now more than ever before. We need to support DCPS arts and humanities education now more than ever before. These are now the budget hearings that are coming up. These are the hearings that speak to funding for the upcoming school year. So uh, be on the lookout for information from us and anyone who wants to work on framing community language for advocacy efforts, 
with me around arts and humanities education specifically, just send me an email. Um, and that's it for today. So thank you all for joining us. Everyone be well. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.